Welcome to josephsmithspolygamy.org, the audio version. 1840 to early 1842, plural marriage is secretly introduced. Sometime in 1840, Joseph Smith first broached the topic of plural marriage privately to trusted friends. Most of the apostles were in England at the time. Church member Cyrus Wheelock remembered some of the earliest teaching from the prophet Joseph Smith regarding plural marriage that occurred in 1840. The first time I recollect hearing him, Joseph Smith, teach was in Iowa at a place called Montrose. It was at Montrose in Iowa at the house of one Joseph Bates Noble. Wheelock also recalled a second discussion on the topic led by the prophet on a rainy and chilly day in a forest setting about a mile west of Montrose. Joseph had to be on the run to keep out of the way of his enemies, and sometimes he would go out into the country to one of our neighbors, for he felt that he could trust anyone that lived in the woods or forest down the river, and we could go out in the timber to talk under the trees about the principles of the church. Amongst other principles, that of baptism for the dead was discussed, and the building of the temple and all those things together. It was at this time, amongst others, that he taught us the principle of plural marriage, but his teaching was not specially directed to me, but to all who were in the company. We talked about it as we might hear, or any brother qualified in having authority to do so will discuss principles when he gets along with his brethren and friend in confidential discourse. The time I was taught to me in Nauvoo, it was not supposed to be practiced as a principle, that is, publicly, like our proceedings in the temple for the dead. It was not taught or practiced openly, but it was given to me, and I understood it to be a crude principle that would be fully and openly revealed to the church when the proper time came for it to be revealed. In addition, Willock testified in 1869, in the fall of the year, A.D. 1840, Joseph Smith taught him the principle of celestial marriage, or a plurality of wives, and that the said Joseph Smith declared that he had received a revelation from God on the subject, and that the angel of the Lord had commanded him, Joseph Smith, to move forward in the said order of marriage, and further, that the said Joseph Smith requested him, Joseph Bates Noble, to step forward and assist him in carrying out the said principle. Louisa Beeman, First Nauvoo, Plural Sealing As the prophet taught in Joseph B. Noble's home in Montrose, Iowa, the audience included members of Joseph Noble's family and his wife's sister, Louisa Beeman. The Noble clan embraced the instructions, and Louisa accepted a plural marriage proposal from the prophet. Noble left multiple historical reports referring to the incident. In 1869, he signed an affidavit affirming that on the 5th day of April, A.D., 1841, at the city of Nauvoo, county of Hancock, state of Illinois, he married or sealed Louisa Beeman to Joseph Smith. In 1892, when asked about the authority he used to seal Louisa Beeman to Joseph Smith, Noble stated with a hint of pride, I know this, that the lawgiver, Joseph Smith, authorized it. I got it all right, right from the prophet himself. That is where I got it. I sealed her to him, and I did a good job, too. Recorded notes from a state conference in 1883 at which Noble spoke report his remark. Elder Noble sealed his wife's sister to Joseph, that being the first plural marriage consummated, performed. The prophet gave the form of the ceremony. Elder Noble repeated the words after him. Elder Noble bore testimony to the purity of character of his sister-in-law, who was a woman of irreproachable morality, who entered into the plural marriage relation on a deep-seated conviction that the doctrine was from God. Brother Nobles also testified that he sealed to Joseph a relative of his own, and that it was the first ceremony of the plural marriage performed in this dispensation, and that it was done in a whisper. After Louisa Beeman, Joseph Smith seeks almost exclusively eternity-only sealings. Likely eight out of the next nine of Joseph Smith's plural marriage proposals, and possibly eleven out of the next twelve, were to legally married women— 
These eight plural ceilings appear to have been for eternity only, meaning a ceiling only for the next life with no marriage or sexual relations on earth. If sexual relations did not take place in the ceilings, then why would Joseph have entered into them in the first place? The answer involves two dynamics. First, it appears that at least some of the women chose Joseph Smith rather than their legal husbands to be their husband after death and eternity. It seems strange that those women would choose someone other than their legal spouses, and these types of ceilings are not allowed today. However, the first generation of church members who had been previously married until death do you part were apparently given a choice in the matter. If this is confusing to observers, it is important to note that none of these plural wives complained. Similarly, their legal husbands left no grievances against the prophet. Officiators and witnesses made no protest. Even apostates in Nauvoo did not attempt to exploit these relationships in their anti-Mormon literature. The second apparent dynamic driving these eternity-only ceilings could be Joseph Smith's deep love for Emma, his legal wife. Historian Lawrence Foster summarized, The introduction of polygamy was complicated by the deep affection that Emma and Joseph had for each other, a bond which is unmistakably revealed in their personal letters. Emma was jealously devoted to Joseph. He, in turn, showed great love for her. The deep attachment between them must have made the introduction of plural marriage particularly painful. Even though he had secretly been sealed to over a dozen women by August 16, 1842, Joseph Smith then reflected in his journal upon his love for Emma. With what unspeakable delight and what transports of joy swelled my bosom when I took by the hand on that night my beloved Emma, she that was my wife, even the wife of my youth and the choice of my heart, Many were the reverberations of my mind when I contemplated for a moment the many scenes we had been called to pass through, the fatigues and the toils, the sorrows, the sufferings, and the joys and consolations from time to time which had strewn our paths and crowned our board. Oh, what a commingling of thought filled my mind for the moment. Again she is here, even in the seventh trouble, undaunted, firm and unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma. Despite his deep feelings for Emma, Joseph apparently succeeded in loving his plural wives. None of them ever complained he had abused them or treated them as objects or chattel. Nevertheless, it is plain that in his heart, Emma held a unique place. That Joseph could love Emma deeply, yet secretly marry other women, is one of the more difficult concepts to reconcile when studying the prophet's practice of polygamy. Toward the end of 1841, three changes occurred in Joseph Smith's strategy for unfolding the practice of polygamy in Nauvoo. Even though the prophet had instructed several members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles regarding restored polygamy as they returned from England in the previous summer, of 1841, none had yet married plural wives, but toward the end of the year, Brigham Young proposed plural marriage to Martha Brotherton, and early 1842, Heber C. Kimball apparently married his first plural wife. In addition, Joseph Smith was sealed to women with no legal husbands with whom conjugality is well documented, some by the plural wives themselves, for example, Melissa Lott and Emily Partridge, or from reliable second-hand witnesses, as in the case of Louisa Beeman, Lucy Walker, Almeria Woodward Johnson, and Eliza Partridge. The third change, which occurred in April, came as Joseph Smith made his second proposal to a previously unmarried woman in Nauvoo. The first woman Joseph chose was Nancy Rigdon, the 19-year-old daughter of his first counselor in the First Presidency, Sidney Rigdon. The proposal turned out badly. Nancy's brother, J. Wycliffe Rigdon, who late in life became a Latter-day Saint, recalled the incident. It happened in this way. Nancy had gone to church meeting, being held in a grove near the temple lot in which the Mormons were then erecting a temple. An old lady friend, Marinda Johnson Hyde, who lived alone, invited her, which Nancy did. When they got to the house and had taken their bonnets off, the old lady began to talk to her about the new doctrine of polygamy, 
which was then being taught, telling Nancy during the conversation that it was a surprise to her when she first heard it, but that she had since come to believe it to be true. While they were talking, Joseph Smith the prophet came into the house and joined them, and the old lady immediately left the room. It was then that Joseph made the proposal of marriage to my sister. Nancy flatly refused him, saying if she ever got married, she would marry a single man or none at all, and thereupon took her bonnet and went home, leaving Joseph at the old lady's home. Apparently, in an attempt to propose plural marriage to her, the prophet dictated a letter to her containing doctrinal teachings that was published by excommunicated member John C. Bennett. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And the path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. But we cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them. And we cannot expect to know all or more than we now know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. That which is wrong under one circumstance may be, and often is, right under another. Right under another. God said, Thou shalt not kill. At another time he said, Thou shalt utterly destroy. This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted, by revelation adapted to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom are placed. Whatever God requires is right. No matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire, if we seek first the kingdom of God, all good things will be added. So with Solomon, first he asked wisdom, and God gave it to him, and with it every desire of his heart, even things which might be considered abominable to all who understand the order of heaven only in part, but which in reality were right because God gave and sanctioned by special revelation. A parent may whip a child unjustly too because he stole an apple, whereas if the child had asked for the apple and the parent had given it, the child would have eaten it with a better appetite. There would have been no stripes. All the pleasure of the apple would have been secured. All the misery of stealing lost. This principle will justly apply to all of God's dealings with his children. Everything that God gives us is lawful and right, and it is proper that we should enjoy his gifts and blessings whenever and wherever he is disposed to bestow. But if we should seize upon those same blessings and enjoyments without law, without revelation, without commandment, those blessings and enjoyments would prove cursings and vexations in the end, and we should have to lie down in sorrow and wailings of everlasting regret." But on obedience there is joy and peace unspotted, unalloyed. And as God has designed our happiness and the happiness of all his creatures, he never has, he never will, institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness which he has designed and which will not end in the greatest amount of good and glory to those who become the recipients of his law and ordinances. Blessings offered but rejected are no longer blessings, but become like the talent hid in the earth by the wicked and slothful servant. The proffered good returns to the giver. The blessing is bestowed on those who will receive and occupy. For unto him that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundantly. But unto him that hath not, or will not receive, shall be taken away that which he hath, or might have had. Be wise today, tis badness to defer. Next day the fatal precedent may plead. Thus on, till wisdom is pushed out of time. Into eternity, our Heavenly Father is more liberal in His views and boundless in His mercies and blessings than we are ready to believe or receive, and at the same time is more terrible to the workers of iniquity, more awful in the executions of His punishments, and more ready to detect every false way than we are apt to suppose Him to be. He will be inquired of by His children, He says, Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. But if you will take that which is not your own, or which I have not given you, you shall be rewarded according to your deeds. 
But no good thing will I withhold from them who walk uprightly before me and do my will in all things, who will listen to my voice and to the voice of my servant whom I have sent. For I delight in those who seek diligently to know my precepts and abide by the law of my kingdom. For all things shall be made known unto them in mine own due time, and in the end they shall have joy. J. Wycliffe Rigdon also related the aftermath. Nancy told father and mother about it. The story got out and it became the talk of the town that Joseph had made a proposition to Nancy Rigdon to become his wife and that she refused him. A few days after the occurrence, Joseph Smith came to my father's house and talked the matter over with the family and my sister. The feelings manifested by our family on this occasion were anything but brotherly or sisterly, more especially on the part of Nancy, as she felt that she had been insulted. A day or two later, Joseph Smith returned to my father's house when matters were satisfactorily adjusted between them and there the matter ended. Despite a sincere effort by the prophet and even a doctrinal epistle that included justifications for plural marriage, he was unsuccessful. Joseph Smith's choice of Nancy Rigdon to receive this plural marriage proposal, the first offered to a previously unmarried woman since he wed Louisa Beeman, is puzzling. Whatever the criteria he used to assess her possible willingness to embrace a new and extremely novel doctrine, the outcome suggests that he had misjudged her. That Joseph might approach Nancy is predictable as he tended to approach daughters of close associates when proposing plural marriage. Why he wrote such a detailed letter to teach her the doctrine is less evident. In similar circumstances, he worked through relatives to initiate the proposals. The letter's contents could have been befuddling to Nancy Rigdon. The doctrines included were new and unique. Its tone and approach do not seem to convey a message that would successfully persuade a teenager to join him in a secret plural marriage. Absent are appeals to loving feelings he may have possessed for her or an offer to marry him in order to enjoy conjugal bliss. It is possible that his real target audience was not the young woman, but the parent. That is, the prophet was trying to instruct Sidney and garner his support for the doctrine. Possibly Joseph hoped that Nancy would respond favorably and through her participation, her father would become converted to the principal. That Joseph would not approach Sidney Rigdon, his counselor in the First Presidency, seems odd. Whereas members of the church are accustomed to the president of the church and the council of the Twelve Apostles making policy and issues of doctrine a matter of unified affirmation, that was not the way Joseph approached church government. Indeed, in the case of plural marriage, it appears those closest in church government to him were not the first to be informed about Joseph's restoration, but rather those he thought would accept the concept. To read more about the practice of polygamy in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, check out Joseph Smith's Polygamy Toward a Better Understanding.